time for uh, J&P Technologies, a small uh, business sub to the SAIC uh, SNMA Flight Safety Office that supports the NASA JSC Flight Safety Office. And uh, I might bring up here this, uh, actually I got this presentation together because I had a request from uh, SpaceX and the crew offices uh, <clears throat> because in this commercial spacecraft we're getting ready to fly now there's a high level of automation and very little uh, or much lesser manual control than what's been used in the past spacecraft programs <clears throat> and some years ago at when the commercial programs were starting to really get underway for crew override, uh, I, with the flight safety office, we developed and I was the lead author of a request to investigate uh, manual control and crew override and so forth. And so I'd like to start here, uh, let's see, you need to back up one slide. Let's see, should be a slide two. If not, I may have to pull up mine. Oh, here we go. Okay. And this just talks about this. In, uh, next slide, please. Slide three. Here we go. This is important because I, I won't be bringing this up later, but if you're a designer and so forth, this is the things you need to consider before you even think about trying to put in a manual control. Uh, one, is the function critical for crew safety or mission? Is the time requirement to perform the function within the normal human response time and performance envelope due to automatic control system failure? In other words, when that system goes out, are you gonna have the ability to do something? And this is a big uh, concern of commercial aircraft as well. Three, is the crew monitoring of the automatic system sufficient to ensure they can seamlessly enter the control loop? Is sufficient information available to the crew to successfully perform the function? <clears throat> Are there sufficient controls or inhibits in place to preclude inadvertent engagement of this manual override capabilities? Next slide. And I uh, will have mission actual cases that pretty much indicate a lot of these later. Next slide. Six, is the crew trained and refreshed in the operation on a regular basis? Is the overall function reliability improved for crew safety and mission success with manual control? Take into account human reliability and mission duration impact. Eight, this is the last item. Does the overall risk benefit trade support implementation of manual control override capabilities. When you can take into consideration technical costs and schedule impacts for the program. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, Mercury program, the majority of the functions were manually controlled. Some critical functions such as emergency escape and flight control were automatic with the manual backup override. And the escape system for ascent could be initiated three ways. Ground command receiver abort signal, astronaut abort handle, or the booster catastrophic failure detection system on the Atlas launcher. Retrograde rocket system, Normal method was closing retrograde firing signal switch within the satellite clock. The switch could be activated by preset clock 
an astronaut could bypass this to start the sequence manually. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There was also a, a capability to do an emergency override for the uh, retro. You could push the fire retro button. And if you were not in this spacecraft correct attitude, you could do a manual fly by wire system to correct yourself. Fly by wire, the automatic stabilization control system was disabled. If you went into fly by wire and you actually had 20 volts connected to the limit switches on the control sticks that actually applied power to the valve civil solenoids. In addition, Mercury had something that you never see on other systems. It actually had another RCS control system that was strictly mechanical. You actually had mechanical linkages from the control handle that went out to the RCS control valves. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Mercury 6 program, astronaut, this was John Glenn, took over manual fly-by-wire control for on-orbit entry when his yaw reaction jet caused an attitude control problem. And then later, uh, during re-entry, because there was a concern about the retro pack attached during the entry, he had to keep that off. Mercury May A7 mission. We had a case where the automatic control system did not maneuver the capsule into the correct retro rocket attitude. Astronauts switched to a fly-by-wire, but failed to shut off the manual system. In other words, he ended up having both systems on. That ended up draining too much fuel. Crew error caused this excessive usage and the depletion actually occurred at a higher altitude, 70 to 80,000 feet. And so his capsule started to swinging. So he ended up deploying the drogue suits at a higher altitude in order to stabilize. And then he also had a crew error in yaw when he did the rocket firing that prevented the capsule from slowing down as much and it actually overshot the planned landing area. MA-9, when the automatic, con oh, by the way, Cooper was on that, I mean, not Cooper, I'm sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Carpenter, I think it was. Carpenter on that flight never flew again uh, after that mission and having those many crew operated errors. MA-9, when the automatic control system failed to short, this was Cooper's flight, we had the co complete electrical failure. So uh, Gordon Cooper had to actually use that manual control linkage in order to come back home safely. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Majority of Gemini spacecraft functions were manual control, but some were automatically controlled with manual backup. In this case, the uh, de malfunction detection system on the uh, launch vehicle and so forth gave indications, but because uh, on Gemini, the crew only had injection seats, you were only good up to about 70,000 feet. But they had, just like they had in their aircraft, they actually would pull a D-ring to start the ejection function if they had a problem. Next slide, please. Harness re uh, release actuator assembly. They installed it and they had a system here. Of course, you had to get out of the seat. This was pretty much just like you had in the military when you're after you'd already bailed out and uh, you had a drug mortar to fire and just stabilize you as you came down. And he had, and those were all manual functions. And next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. The Ohm's uh, attitude maneuvering system uh, was a bipropellant system. 
and two 95 pound thrusters, eight 23 pound control and two 79 495 thrusters. And the control was either manual via the hand controller or automatic via the attitude uh, control maneuver electronic system. And you had a primary and secondary system. Uh, and you had the capability to uh, override the automatic system. Velocity control was along three axes, but there was no provisions for automated. It's strictly manual. Next slide, please. Reentry control system was a bipilot uh, system and had eight 23 pound thrusters located in the RCS section between the reentry module cabin and the rendezvous recovery section. The crew could select between two completely independent reentry control rings, as they call it, ring A or ring B, and they, they could, had a direct bypass or, and could override the automatic system. Next slide, please. The retrograde rocket system had four solid propellant rockets. There was also a manual backup initiation capability for that. The uh, ascent Titan launch field guidance was the primary system for ascent guidance, but for Gemini, the crew could manually switch to a Gemini computer for backup guidance of the launch vehicle for first and second stages. Next slide, please. Had 10 pro, uh, flights during the Gemini program. Gemini 4 had to perform a rolling manual reentry when the onboard computer failed. Gemini 5 had to do, take manual control to minimize a landing point error due to a pro, computer programming error. And on Gemini 8, the commander had to manually select. This, by the way, was when uh, Neil Armstrong was the commander on Gemini 8. He had to manually select or entry RCS system to regain spacecraft control, saving the spacecraft life. This is a case where they had been docked to the Agena capsule. And a lot of the training before, they were always concerned about the control system on the Agena. And so if anything came up, they were told to quickly kind of uh, disendock from the Agena vehicle. All of a sudden, shortly after they were docked, they had a uh, starting having uh, firing, or, you know, attitude problems and so forth. So they quickly did what they were programmed to do: is to undock from the Gina, thinking, of course, that it was the Gina somehow. Instead, in this case, the Gemini spacecraft itself was had a stuck-on thruster, and so the you ended up spinning up the spacecraft much faster after you de-dock from the uh, Gina. They were getting close, very close to blackout, but uh, Neil quickly switched to the re-entry system and stabilized the spacecraft, separated from that backstage, and they had to come home right away since they were on the re-entry control system. That was a very close call for the crew. Next slide. Gemini 12, the backup manual capability was used for rendezvous when the automatic rendezvous motor failed due to problems with the Ohm's attitude control system. This was a flight that Buzz Aldrin was on. He was a rendezvous expert uh, and written papers on it during his uh, thesis and so forth. So actually, some of what he had on board was all had allowed them to uh, go ahead and do a manual rendezvous with the target vehicle. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Apollo. The majority of the Apollo functions were manual controlled. However, critical functions were automatic with manual crew backup override. Launch escape system and gorge system. You had the emergency detection system in the launch Saturn launch vehicle. That could automatically avoid you if you were outside the criteria. Uh, 
it was triple redundant, voted two out of three strings. If you had two votes, and by the way, the votes were an interruption of the power line. You actually had power routed 120 degrees apart, power and return from the command module that went all the way down to the Saturn IU. Uh, and there in the Saturn IU, you had relays such that whenever they got a signal to abort, they opened up that line. And the nice thing about that, by having that system in place, if you had a structural breakup of the launch vehicle, it would automatically initiate the abort. And that hap actually happened during a little Joe 2 launch for the abort system out in uh, White Sands. I was there for that. But we actually had a fin, garf fin go hard over, vehicle spun around till the launch vehicle completely come apart. Because of that broke the wires, it automatically caused the abort of the spacecraft and saved, saved the spacecraft. Let's see here, we somehow the chart got changed. Can we go to a full chart? Hold on a minute. Or I can go to share screen on my side and quickly catch up maybe. Okay, there we go. Uh, next slide. The Earth landing system was automatic if the crew enabled it. It was designed to be that way. You had a system A and B. You could do all the functions required for the landing system. Reaction control system, command source module, they had two stabilization control systems. That's the automatic system for the control of RCS system A and system B. The crew could select controller power direct you could go to RCS direct to either bus A or B and the crew could control the CSM or command module attitude with that end controller. Next slide, please. Docking system. Uh, when you had two or three capture latches for soft docture, dock, uh, capture that wouldn't power up the uh, panel switch to allow the crew to retract the probe. You retracted the probe by firing a pyro and that would bring the vehicle in to close contact and you had structural latches that would automatically trip and dock you. So that was an all uh, manual function. Service uh, propulsion system was the main engine, of course, to do mid course corrections, send your way onto the moon and also bring you back from the moon. Uh, the crew had the capability to uh, go from the automatic system normal to a direct on, so they could automatic, they could manually fire the SPS engine. It turns out during all of the Apollo missions, everything was done uh, automatic, that we never did really have a case where the crew had to do a manual burn. Next slide, please. Lunar module primary gamuts, uh, navigation control called the ping system. Uh, was automatically controlled and landed the limb at a targeted landing area. The crew capability to switch to semi-automatic semi control uh, and then manually control the landing. And as we now, as we know, Apollo 11 and most of the uh, lunar crews uh, ended up going switching to uh, manual control to do the final landing. Abort guidance system on the limb. When you were coming up from the moon, if there was a real problem, you could switch attitude hold, which was automatic, and go uh, the ag switch could be switched to ags and uh, automatically try to uh, rendezvous and dock with the CSM in lunar orbit. Next slide, please. During rendezvous, the pings automatic control the limbs rendezvous with the CSM in lunar orbit. Lunar module descent and ascent engines. The guidance system controlled the descent and ascent engine burns 
and the AGs could also control the engines. That's our board guidance system. The crew, however, had the capability to manually start and stop the descent and ascent burns by pushing their start stop buttons. The engine thrust control engine arm switch would have to be positioned from off to descent or ascent. So you had to do two functions there. You had to switch this off to ascent or descent. And then of course, you're, uh, then you could go to your start or stop buttons. Next slide, please. Saturn V launch vehicle guidance. During uh, the second stage and the S4B third stage, the crew's rotational hand controller was used to generate attitude error signals if the launch vehicle primary guidance failed, which we really never had a case of. Go ahead, next slide. We're going to the Apollo crewed missions. Okay, Apollo 10, the commander, this was, uh, by the way, this was Tom Stafford. They were coming up from the moon. They were already launched coming up from the moon. And he inadvertently, he was investigating some, uh, what he thought was an electrical problem. And the, and the crew are in their spacesuits. They have the helmet off uh, and gloves off, but they still have, uh, they're in their suits. He inadvertently hit the uh, stabilization control, that AG switch I talked about. So it knocked it out of attitude hold and put him in that abort mode. So all of a sudden the lunar modules flipped the spacecraft around and end over it, trying to find with the uh, radar system, find the CSM to automatically go rendezvous with it. So basically the limb at that point was out of control. Commander quickly grabbed the hand controller. He didn't know of course that he inadvertent what he had done, switched to manual, jettisoned the limb descent stage regain control of the lunar module and successfully completed the uh, rendezvous and docking. So that was another case where having manual capability uh, saved the crew. In this case, it was due to crew error that got them in this situation. Apollo 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all but 15. The commander took over uh, automatic control because of hazardous ter terrain, hazardous terrain. Next slide, please. Also during the Apollo 12 for ascent, we actually had a lightning strike, actually two lightning strikes. The lightning strike disconnected all fuel cell which applies all DC power, main bus power, and also AC power, which caused the uh, loss of onboard computer onboard. And the crew was able to mainly regain power and flight control, preventing loss of the mission. Okay, what, what was that? We, back in those days, we had Zener diodes that were in uh, the circuitry. You used some discrete solid state circuitry in those days. And in the case of the motor switches that connected the fuel cells to the main bus and the AC power from the inverters to the AC buses, there was an overload sensor in there that if you had a, a current overload, it would automatically disconnect. Well, it turns out when you have it a sharp negative voltage increase, a uh, negative spike, negative spike on the vehicle, which happened in this particular lightning case, it actually tripped on every NCR we had in the vehicle, which was all of these overload sensors. So that's what tripped all of the DC power and AC power off, was tri actually tripping those Zener diodes <coughs> uh, to on and disconnecting everything. Now, the reason when crew was able to regain control is we have an entry battery system on the spacecraft that are empowered like an emergency, an emergency bus, not the main bus, emergency bus. So, but those, that uh, bus allowed the powering of the manual switches and allowed the crew to uh, 
calmly reconnect the fuel cells and reconnect their AC power. And eventually it brought things online, even though they had some instrumentation failure and the crew was able to complete the mission. <clears throat> Apollo 13, you had a service module oxygen tank explosion, resulted in the loss of all the uh, oxygen and electrical power. <clears throat> So you ended up having a complete power down of the command service module and a major power down of the ma ma <clears throat> major power. And in order to get back, since uh, the only source of power was the lunar module, the crew had to do a manual crew control of the spacecraft as you, ended, you just about had to turn off everything in the lunar module to save the battery power. And a lot of us are familiar with that from the Apollo 13 movie. Uh, just back up just one, the Apollo 14. There we go. <clears throat> Apollo, uh, I'm sorry, Apollo 15. That was that one case I mentioned about, uh, he took over automatic control because he was going to be on automatic, but it turns out it wasn't bringing him into the pre-selected landing area. So he took over control for that reason. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Skylab program. We had three uh, band crew missions Skylab. Skylab 2 mission was unable after many attempts to obtain a CSM docking probe capture. The crew had to use a manual procedure to bypass the capture interlock and manually retract the probe. Okay, prior to Skylab 2, going back to all the way to back to Apollo, port, Apollo 14, when they had problems docking with the lunar module, I had, before that mission, I had developed a procedure because I was always worried. I was responsible for the sequencing system, the fires, all the pyros. And so I'd worried that what if those little small capture latches really wouldn't make good capture, is there a way to fire that pyro, retract the probe, and maybe allow the crew to carefully maneuver in and hit those uh, switches around the periphery and still do the hard dock. Well, on Apollo 14, after many attempts, they were able to finally uh, dock, but that took periods of hours and time to do that. In that period of time, I had gotten my procedure which allowed you to uh, take an onboard connector, cut off the connector, have the wires. And I had a, my procedure allowed you to go into the GSE connectors on the lunar docking events controller and you could insert in the proper pins, which I identified. You could use like throw the utility power switch or something and retract that probe. It turns out on Apollo 14, we didn't have to use the procedure. But the procedure got improved later on to where we had a cable on board the spacecraft that would allow you to directly connect up and you had quick opening fasteners to allow you to get access to that area where the lunar docking events controller was. So we had developed a procedure. If you really had to use that, it'd be much simpler to use. Well, for Skylab 2, it turns out they had to use it. They weren't able to get and by the way, Skylab 2 was the mission that they had to go up because the workshop was in real trouble with thermal problems. And the crew had to go up there and not only protect the uh, spacecraft there, uh, but also try to get another solar array out. So they basically were going to save Skylab. <clears throat> anyway, they, they went to my the procedure, which was on board, which allowed you to get out the that cable and connect up to the utility power outlet, fire that switch, retract the probe, which it did. And then the uh, commander could carefully go in, which they were able to do and latch up. And so I basically saved scale, save Skylab plus it allowed the, uh, the docking of the crew to go in. Skylab four, this is a little story with it too. Uh, Ed Gibson was one of the crew members on that spacecraft, and uh, he was the chairman of the Orion Standing Review Board that we had back 
early in the program. He was the, going to be the chairman of that. They pulled a lot of us uh, ex Apollo people onto that uh, review board as a critical like graybeard oversight on the Orion program. And I was one of those on there. And I had written up uh, a listing of all uh, anomalies and lessons learned on Apollo and Skylab and so forth. Ed Gibson was looking at my list. He thought it was real good, but he said, how come you don't have Skylab 4 down here? And I says, why? And he says, I thought we were going to die. I said, what? He said, yes, I thought we were going to die. And uh, when they were getting ready for entry, uh, the crew, it turns out the crew procedures they're on one panel, this is where you get into this human factors thing for manual backups or whatever. Uh, on the commander's uh, circuit breaker panel to his left, uh, on that same panel, there's four circuit breakers for the stabilization control system. Pitch, yaw, systems A and B, four circuit breakers. And Located on the same panel close by were four circuit breakers. S, so you had SCS, pitch and yaw, A and B. Close by you had SPS, pitch and yaw, A and B. The checklist calls out opening up SPS, pitch and yaw circuit breakers because they provided power down to the uh, gimbal motors and you had to dead fast that before you separated get ready for entry and you separate from the command source module you had a guillotine cut come down and cut that so you didn't want to short out the system so you the procedure called you out to open up those four circuit breakers uh well guess what the crew didn't realize it but they had opened up those four scs a and B breakers instead of the SPS A and B breakers. And after all, it's been almost three or four months since was the last time the crew were even in the command module because the last time they were in it when they is when they docked. So you got this long period of time, crews all suited up. Uh, anyway, so they when they did separate, they didn't have the automatic system to bring them around to the proper attitude. As a result, they were apex forward, which meant they would burn up on re-entry if they came in that way, the crew would be lost. So that was the big scare factor for them. Hey, nothing's happening here. We're headed in the wrong direction. But they happened to remember, hey, we got command mola command module RCS control. So they switched that manual switch to manual RCS control and were of course quickly gotten into the right attitude and uh, came down okay. And then, then of course, uh, post, post flight, they found out because when the crews went in and looked, they saw the wrong circuit breakers were operating. But those are, there's a lot of lessons learned there associated with training and a lot of things. That's one reason that some folks know we went on, on the space shuttle program, you ended up having the crew actually go through a, like assimilation and do everything and go through all this before you did the re-entry. So you weren't, uh, so that would all be refreshed. This is a good, good example of how you need to do that. And also in terms of labeling of critical functions, location of critical functions, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Apollo Soyuz Test Project, ASTP. Uh, during the second docking, the first docking, Tom Stafford was the uh, commander of that mission. Uh, he had two rookies with him, Vance Brandt and uh, Deke Slayton. Deke Slayton, you remember, uh, wasn't able to fly earlier, but he finally uh, got rid of his problem, uh, heart problem or what it was. I can't remember now exactly what that was. But anyway, the docs cleared him. And so he was 
going to fly on the ASTP mission, Deke Slate was. He's in the far right seat, uh, which would be docking module pilot. You had the commander, then you had the command module pilot, Vance Brand in the middle, docking module pilot on the far right, which of course used to be the location of the lunar module pilot. Okay, the plan was ahead of time was Tom would do the first docking with the Soyuz, went extremely smooth and easy and so forth. He was great at rendezvous and docking. Uh, the, it was also planned that Deke would get to do the manual uh, docking with the uh, docking module and he would do that. Well, uh, at 100 meters out, he was a little bit off. The docking target was washed out against the earth background. And even though the docking target was washed out, he kind of pressed on anyway. Okay, then he made contact a little harder than normal. And then uh, after he made contact and he had the, the uh, contacts closed and connected up, he inadvertently uh, bumped and fired the roll thrusters for three seconds. And that caused the Soyuz to really bang around. And matter of fact, uh, the Russians had their uh, Leonov, who was in the, the commander of the Soyuz, in his uh, book, talks about how they thought they were going to die because it, they were swinging around so much. It took their docking system to the limits. So they thought they uh, would be done in. Needless to say, nothing was said. However, later on, MCC did apologize. <coughs> But that was kind of hushed up on the US side. Uh, I might pass on though, because of that, the Russians were really concerned about our, our manual docking. So one time when they were over here during the shuttle program, we were gonna be docking with Mir. I had my safety team over and we were over in the simulators building 16. They were showing him everything that was being done with the laptops and all the things for the manual docking. And uh, the Russians that were with me were extremely concerned. You could see they're very concerned, asking a lot of questions and all that. And then after they left, some of the guys on the simulators would say, why are these Russians so worried or concerned about this manual docking? So I <laughs> explained to them, the ASTP, what happened on ASTP? Because you don't ever hear about that hardly. And they said, oh, now we understand. Okay. Uh, okay, next problem. Well, another case where the crew almost killed themselves. Uh, Tom Stafford was on this one too. Uh, I was in the middle of this one a little bit myself. Is my crew safety counter, uh, crew ops counterpart that was responsible for crew procedures came over to me. We worked closely together and I worked with the MOD guys. And he came over and he said, Gary, the uh, Tom Stafford wants to use his uh, Apollo 10 procedures for uh, the Earth landing system. He's not going to follow the later procedures. I had worked very hard. The crew was always worried about. Uh, barrel switches. Even though we had two systems, we had barrel switches in two of them in series. In other words, there was no single point failures that could occur on the barrel switches. However, during ascent, of course, uh, early on, those are closed, but you don't have the system armed up. Anyway, the crew were always concerned, even when you're in flight and in vacuum, you name it, they were always concerned that about barrel switches. And so as they themselves wouldn't arm up the pyro buses and arm up and arm up the earth landing system till you got down to like 50,000 feet or something <clears throat> such that if all of a sudden things started in there, they were low enough altitude for the drogue shoots and so forth, they'd be okay. Well, I worked very hard because the system was designed to be automated that they, you know, enable the system 
because we really wanted to enable it ahead of time and check it out and verify. And then that way, if the crew passed out or whatever, they'd automatically come in. Anyway, so I asked John to schedule a, a meeting with Tom Stafford. So I went over and met with Tom and John and I, and I went through and explained to Tom all the changes we'd made to the manual switches. And we did add in redundant contacts on the manual switches, so you couldn't inadvertently control that. And with the crew procedures had been changed to keep the pyro buses armed up after uh, command service module SEP earlier to keep, so that's one function you didn't have to do. And uh, I also argued with him that to go to ELS auto at that point there, and uh, that way the system would be all armed up. Well, Tom, as he left the meeting, said, we're, not, we're never going to forget to put out the parachutes. Uh, you know, you know the old saying, famous last words. They, uh, blow, okay, so they come roaring in and uh, the crews begin to th say, oh, no. oh, and they did, ended up finally uh, arming up the pyro buses, but that was at that lower altitude. Then they were sitting there calmly waiting and they got thinking, you know what, we're getting off the low, nothing's happening here. So Vance Brand quickly goes over, he knows we have the manual push button. So he quickly jettisons the apex cover, quickly puts out the drogues parachutes and everything. And it just so happens that altitude they were at, we were doing this all at a very low altitude. The spacecraft was designed such that uh, what, before your relief valves were open or anything, we always burned off the propellant because <clears throat> you didn't want to land with toxic propellant on board in case you had, you know, cracked open the tank or something else. So you had this automatic sequence to dump propellants overboard, which initially would be firing engines and then you go to whichever's left over. Well, it turns out what's left over a little bit is M204, which is very toxic. So they were low enough altitude when they were on the drogue chutes and all of that and uh, coming out. And by the way, Tom did suddenly recognize uh, after they were on the drogue chutes, he said, oh, ELS is not an auto. He throws it to auto. Well, then they were at such a low altitude when he went to auto, the manual parachutes deployed right away. And then once they were on the manual parachutes and everything, they start this propellant dump sequence. And the uh, low enough altitude, the pressure relief valve, which is located on the side of the spacecraft close to Vance Brandt, is sucking in propellant fumes, N2O propellant fumes. Next slide. Okay, well, I need to finish up here a little bit. Fumes got so bad, Vance Brand pantsed out. Crew was scrambling around to get on their oxygen masks, emergency oxygen masks. They did. Tom uh, quickly put the mask on Vance Brand and brought him around. Uh, anyway, the crew then, of course, then finally landed and got picked up. The, uh, excuse me, the, uh, because of that exposure though, the crew was in the hospital for two weeks when they got back to Hawaii after that flight. They'd been exposed to what was considered lethal levels of N204 uh, and so forth. So they were very lucky. At the same time, Deke Slayton was lucky for that himself. They do, They were, do, of course, doing extensive uh, x-rays of their lungs and so forth for that. And they noted a very, very small place on Deke Slayton's lungs. That was the beginnings of lung cancer. And so he was able to get operated for that right away and uh, was able to live a lot longer. He ended up eventually dying of lung cancer, but that was much later. Uh, matter of fact, he was in charge of the uh, uh, shuttle uh, program who we were doing the landing operations out at, uh, you know, with the, uh, where we uh, dropped the shuttle off, 
from the uh, 747 and did those uh, ALT uh, landings out at uh, Edwards for the, and so forth. Deke Slayton was a program manager of that operation out there, you know. Okay, special program. Well, we had great advances in avionics in design and of course a lot more complexity and automation and control functions. We had uh, data buses, MDMs, but we did still keep a lot of manual capability functions on board, just strictly manual. You had that for landing, docking systems. In other words, you had to, you had to uh, manually deploy the landing gear. That was not automatic. <clears throat> docking system the, the same way, that was automatic. System management on board, if you had problems, that was all manual. And if you want to reconfigure the uh, automated flight control system in the computers, that was also manual. Uh, and our RMS remote manipulator system was mainly, uh, mainly operated manually, but there were some automatic modes as well. Uh, next slide, please. Did, the crew did have manual control of the mains, uh, main engine throttles uh, if they had certain anomalies. They had manual control stick steering uh, available for uh, auto guidance flight control system uh, for ascent, uh, able and so forth. And of course you had your standard rudder pedals and all the things for doing a manual crew landing like you do an aircraft. Uh, next slide, please. Also had the capability to manually shut down the SSMEs if need be. And they could also uh, enable and disable automatic uh, shutdown limits if required. And uh, the crew could manually initiate aborts during acid, which was, as we know, some uh, R as the RTLS system. And uh, <clears throat> that could be done by using a, a abort mode rotary switch and the abort push button. For once again, you had two functions the crew had to do. And the crew could manually command the external tank separation uh, using the external tank separation switch and push button. Once again, you had two functions there, which goes back to that case on Apollo 10, you remember where you bumped the one switch. Well, if you had two switches, one to arm up that when it was needed and the other that bumping of the one switch wouldn't have caused that problem. So it's always good uh, when you have this uh, manual capability to have that. Next slide, please. And the uh, manual attitude control was also upper on, on uh, operation on board for on orbit. And of course we had a station at the, at the back where you can operate from back there. Next slide, please. Okay, during the STS-9 <clears throat> STS landing, uh, John Young was the commander uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, the pilot slipped my mind and Brewster Shaw, Brewster Shaw was the pilot, okay. And we'd had a, I need to back up a little bit because on orbit, we actually had a general, uh, purpose computer two failed on orbit. Uh, well, no, wait a minute. We had a computer fail on orbit, a hard failure. And uh, it had to, and then we had to turn it off. It turns out she actually had a short in uh, one of the chips and uh, memory system, I think, uh, or something on the, on the computer. And then shortly after that, she actually had another GPC fail, but they were able to recover that one. So because one GP2, uh, GP, GPC had failed, okay, they had done, they had to do this reconfiguration of the avionics chains, the four strings of avionics on which computers were on which string and, and so forth. <clears throat> okay. And, but then during landing, that GPC that had been recovered on orbit did hard fail. Uh, 
right there when they were landing. And so the pilot rooster went through a reconfiguration for that. The problem here is he was going through his normal reconfiguration, forgetting that that normal configuration had been changed on orbit. So in an actuality, he caused a complete loss of flight control during that reconfiguration. And, he, and here's a case where the crew had no visual displays of what that confer, configuration was. In other words, he would have had to remember what he did back there on orbit. Now, fortunately for the crew, they were already, they were already had landed. Okay, they were on the main, main, the main gear was down and everything. So the loss of control wasn't that big a deal. And there wasn't a lot said about it beyond the mission. It did result in, in developing uh, cards, uh, display cards for the crew that if you ever did a configuration on orbit, you had those things on the panel right next to you. So if you ever, this situation ever occurred later, you knew exactly which configuration you had to go to. Uh, so they used cue cards. But this is a good example of this not having the right sensors back to the crew on system configuration in order to be quick, in order to quickly be able to uh, re, uh, re uh, get your control back. STS 32. Uh, here's a case. Van, uh, not Vance Brandt. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dan Brandenstein. There you go. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Dan Brandenstein. <laughs> and, you know, as you get on in age, you, those times go, I used to have all those guys. Matter of fact, all these people we're talking about, I know very well, uh, especially John Young. Uh, and Dan Brandstein went to our church and everything. But anyway, Dan was the commander of that mission. Crew was asleep. We're on orbit. Uh, and the INCO at that time, uh, they were going to have to send up a state vector to the uh, shuttle. And they're getting close to LOS. And you had to do it in the AOS or LOS. And so he, he sent up the command. The, the space, the shuttle rejected the command, which was the right thing to do because the command had gotten garbage uh, since it was close to AO, uh, LOS. So a signal came back that it that he had been rejected. Inco forced it to go in. Well, that immediately you had a case where that the, the spacecraft thought the uh, you know, you're flying around the center of the earth, whatever. But anyway, the vehicle went into a spin. Fortunately, we were on vernier, vernier controls. Uh, if we'd have been on the primary RCS, this mission would have been a goner right away. On verniers, it started spinning up. And the, we up late quickly to get the crew awake. And they got awake and Dane got awake, but they were, you know, they were really tumbling. And so he got up and got control of the spacecraft, but they were getting close to this stage where centrifugal forces and et cetera would have almost caused them to lose it. So uh, I won't mention his name. I know who that INCO was because at that particular time, I was still uh, working uh, over, I think, in uh, flight operations at that time, I can't remember now. But I know I know who that was. But anyway, needless to say, he never was on console again. Uh, next slide. STS three. Uh, final transition, and this was a case. Uh, it was taken. We were going to be doing it for the first time out our backup landing area in, in uh, New Mexico. But at the same time, we were wanting to try and do this auto land uh, to stay in auto land as long as we could to uh, see about that capability. 
Well, the final transition from autopilot to crew manual control was delayed uh, to test the automatic landing system over what you'd normally do. This late transition did not allow the commander sufficient time to become familiar with the vehicle handling characteristics prior to landing, which involves relatively complex flare derotation de maneuvers. Additionally, the landing occurred at the alternate landing site in Mexico, which is higher altitude, having lower atmospheric pressure and drag. This resulted in a hard, fast landing and actually having the, the vehicle get into what we call PIO, pilot-induced oscillation, up and down, up and down while it's landing. Uh, during approach on STS-37, the commander, and this was Steve Nagel, uh, which I know real well. The other was Joe, uh, Joe Engel uh, for three. <clears throat> I believe with Joe Engel, three, three, I can't remember now. Steve Nagel was 37. He misinterpreted the uh, in indication of low energy around the hack as high energy. And the high winds at low altitude resulted in a low energy landing that was <clears throat> 623 feet short of the runway threshold. Okay, so here's the case of pilot error. Needless to say, unfortunately, Steve is a great guy. I know him well. Unfortunately, he didn't fly again. Uh, STS-90 manual control during landing resulted in a hard, fast landing due to human factors and road wind gusts. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, there was also a number of cases that were really not documented, but you know, if you ever bump the uh, hand controllers or so forth, you automatically got out of uh, <clears throat> automatic. So there's often cases that occurred where they were inadvertently bumped, crew quickly recognized it and were able to get back. Uh, and, the, and so there was really not many functions, but it, the crews will tell you that often inadvertently happened. <clears throat> and then for uh, many of the functions, as I mentioned, uh, control was manual, all landing is docking, is docking to the mirror and to the ISS were all done manually. And, uh, and of course, the little I can mention before, landing gear, drag sheet deployment, et cetera. Next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> I might uh, point out here, uh, that I've got a report that uh, <clears throat> covers all this that I developed uh, there. I think I mentioned at the beginning was developed back when the commercial guys were coming around. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, report, by the way, which I could uh, send uh, as Vanna to send out whoever would like to have it. it. The reason I mention that now I cover the uh, Soyuz, uh, the, the Russian spacecraft, the early Vostuds, Vashus. I talk about their manual capability and automatic capability in that one report. So you get a discussion about all that as well as what I covered for US. US is covered here for lack of, you know, lack of my time, because as you know, I spent a lot of time expounding beyond the the charts uh, from personal experience on these anomaly situations. Uh, we're a little bit past the hour, but let me go through this chart because it's a, it's a great summary if you wanted to glance at something. First, you need to understand what's <clears throat> mentioned at the bottom. You have a check mark if you had manual capability. And by that check mark, if the manual capability was used for normal operations, you had an in, or if it was used for strictly contingency, in other words, then you had a C. And then of course you had an X where manual cap capability is not provided. And as you'll notice that uh, on Soyuz, they did not have near the manual capability we've had on our spacecraft. And so, uh, 
it mainly dealt with the abort situation and attitude control. And uh, in this case, you're at it, abort initiation on the contingency. This particular contingency was ground command, <laughs> not, not crew. Uh, they still, to this day, they still don't have manual capability. And of course they do for attitude control and they do for their burns and rendezvous. And of course, as we well know, for docking and undocking. And of course they, they have an automatic system for docking and undocking. That's the reason you have both a C and an N there. And then as you can see on the case of Mercury and Gemini, uh, places where you didn't have the manual for those vehicles. And then as you can see for Apollo, you pretty much have coverage all the way down. And then of course, space shuttle, and then the space shuttle of course covers this uh, unique landing stuff. Uh, okay, uh, I ran a little over on time, but uh, the uh, I'm open for questions and answers. So, uh, Well, that face looks familiar. <laughs> Good morning, Bonnie. Uh, good morning. So, uh, 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 Dan was the commander. I won't, I can share with you what it was like on the vehicle. <laughs> Great. We'd like to hear from you. Well, anytime you hear a master alarm in the middle of the night, it does wake you up. Uh, and I think the first thing I was down sleeping on the mid deck and uh, asked Dan what was going on. And he says, well, the moon seems to be orbiting our vehicle. As you recall, there was a big moon out that night, uh, but it got recovered pretty quickly once he got control of the vehicle. Great. Hey, Gary. Really good to see you and hear from you. <laughs> And uh, Bonnie knows all about these Soyuz. <laughs> Gary, thank you for such a great uh, presentation. I was uh, looking at your table one, the summary of manual controls and uh, capabilities by program, and I couldn't help myself to think that uh, this, there's uh, at least one more or maybe two more uh, uh, columns need to be added now because uh, since we have a commercial capabilities and commercial vehicles are flying, hopefully uh, no uh, uh, contingency or at least uh, not known yet, but uh, uh, the, the capabilities it's definitely can be updated. And uh, in addition to that, we need to add the gateway as a program uh, uh, in, in a few years when we start flying it. Okay, let me uh, bring up just one thing here. And share the sure. Screen. Do you do you want to share? Yeah, just just to, hold on. Yes. Um, okay. I'll bring it. You should be able to share okay. right now. What this is? That's a report I was talking about, and as you can see, it was developed way back in twenty. Uh, you're not sharing it. Oh, I'm sorry, Gary. At least we don't see it. Share. Okay. I'm sorry. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Uh, as you can see, this developed back in 2013. It was back at this time we were talking a lot about the commercial uh, vehicles coming on. And there was a lot of concern from the crew office as well, because they were hearing uh, lots of words about this automation and everything. So that's when we uh, developed this uh, report and this pre presentation is from that report. Um, and also, just since we've started flying the commercial vehicles, uh, all of a sudden the crew office and SpaceX, SpaceX themselves, have gotten a, had gotten always a lot of questions about the manual capability. The Boeing, I, I think the Boeing spacecraft has a little bit more manual capability than the SpaceX. However, both are pretty automated. And so the request for me to uh, 
some of the folks had come across this manual uh, report. The crew officer was aware of my report and uh, indicated. And so I got a request from SpaceX to actually make, give, a, give them a presentation, which was given uh, early December, just last year, early December. And it's a presentation I just went through now. And uh, because they've been wanting to, uh, needed to take a look at this and, you know, let's see what needs to be done. I pointed out, I felt like a couple of things. One is for uh, abort functions for ascent. I almost felt like that the uh, crew must have manual capability because Bonnie's probably heard about this and knows about it too. The Russians had a case where they had a crew on board on the pad and they had a fire on the launch vehicle and the fire actually burned through the wiring that would send the automatic signal from the launch vehicle to the spacecraft. And the, uh, fortunately, the ground command was able to send the command and get the command in in time to abort the uh, Soyuz crew off the pad and save them. So, you know, and the crew, by the way, was fully aware they had a really bad problem, but they were sitting there in the situation, there's nothing they could do about it. And you had to depend on the ground crew. Okay, well, I'll let you go back uh, here. You need to stop sharing. Okay, let's see how, how do I stop sharing. Oh, stop sharing, there it is. Right. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? The floor floor is open. I, I see if you don't mind, I, I can read uh, at least one question. There's a, a, a thank you for Andrew uh, for a presentation and for your service to the space program, uh, Gary. And then uh, Bonnie also thank, thanked you for the many years of uh, serving human space flight safety. I, I can uh, add to what uh, Bonnie uh, said is that uh, um, I, I have a privilege of working on gateway program. And uh, when you were talking about GPCs, that's exactly what we're going through with the crew office, uh, uh, working on uh, design of the crew displays and the uh, functionality of GPCs, because that will be a main interface for a uh, crew with the various systems of the gateway. So it's a uh, extremely important, timely, and uh, I am glad that we are recording it because I will definitely recommend to my team to listen and review your slides. And perhaps they even will reach out to you for additional um, questions, information, because uh, again, uh, we should not forget what the knowledge that we have accumulated with uh, many years of uh, working in various programs. And uh, um, we can trans, tr uh, use that knowledge instead of reinventing the wheel. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, if you like, I can send you that report. So if others that listen to this want to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, I have a question, please. It's Bernie Rosenbaum, Gary. Yeah. Hey, oh, so uh, hello there. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I spent 50 years there at NASA starting in 63. And so I was working at Gemini. And you mentioned Gemini 8, and as you, I'm sure you're aware, the problem there was that we had a, a short somewhere in the ground wire, and for some reason... Well, it turns out, it turns out you had a, a stud-mounted uh, diode in the, the circuit for firing the jet, and that's shorted to ground. Back in those days, you, in the control systems, you, you'd short the ground to turn something on. You had to short the ground on that and uh, that caused the firing of that. that now, that, that's the best they were able to determine later on is probably what, what caused the short because they had problems with those diodes that were stud mounted that if it wasn't careful, you could break down and uh, short. Uh, but it was a hard short, you're right. Yeah, and, and on that one, was it, I thought Gemini was unique where they were shorting the ground side as opposed to control the turn control the thrusters on and off as opposed to the the power side well they were but the, the <laughs> here's a case where that short to ground was like a command to right I, right I, I, I understand that what i'm wondering or asking is 
what was the rationale on controlling the thing from the ground side as opposed to from the power supply side? Yeah, well, in those days, it strictly had to do with the capability of the solid state devices at the time. They couldn't operate at the higher voltages. So you always had them in the ground side. Now, and that's not true nowadays. Don't get me wrong. That's not true nowadays. Now, at the same time, the Russians will tell you, we don't have shorts in the wiring or so forth. And that's because they always, they don't use a single point ground system, okay? They always uh, have a power in return. So in the, to, to be able to uh, inadvertently operate uh, on the Soyuz, you got to basically have two wire shorts. You got to be able to short the power. In other words, if they have something short the ground, that won't fire anything because you got to short the power return. Well, so the, the Russians yeah. kind of have additional level of redundancy in the wiring that we don't have. Okay, so there's now a switch they, on that's both. Done, that's done for EMI reasons. We do it because single point ground system is by, is much better for uh, reducing uh, requirements of EMI and then using the, but that sets you up for, uh, you know, the case where you can have shorts to ground. Now they do have their ground power return tied in the structure by a high resistance resistor. Okay, a high resistance resistor. That's done to bleed off any sort of, you know, electrostatic function. Okay. But, but uh, and I was fairly impressed when I first heard about that way back during the Apollo Soyuz program. I, I thought, well, that is a pretty good deal that they got this, uh, you know, power. Ice. They have their returns isolated from structure. Okay, but you're saying on the Soyuz, they 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 have a switch both on the power side and on the ground side, both of which have to close to turn the thruster on. Uh, <clears throat> they could, but at the same time, if you're if you're controlling that from a box that's got that power return also in that box, then you just of course you have to switch the uh, the power side. But you're right that you got to uh, you got to have uh, both both power and return. Okay. Yeah, that that would give you some additional reliability of a false turn on. That's for sure. Yeah. But it doubles the chances of something failing too, because you have to have both of them on to turn on. Right, right. So, and of course they have two systems usually, yeah, two or three. Okay. All right, but excellent talk. I mean, you, you obviously spent some lot of time putting this together. Did SpaceX really jump into a lot of this stuff and take, take your recommendations at heart, what you were talking about? Uh, I had questions, several questions. One is, uh, they wanted to know what I thought about SpaceX, and I told them I was very well impressed with them, mainly because I was really impressed with the amount of testing they do on everything. Mm -hmm. They don't depend a lot on analysis. They do much testing, as we know. You know, they, they have no problem blow, blowing up a launch vehicle uh, during the early testing phases because they feel like they can learn something from that and so forth, and I think that's very good. They uh, and I, I told them in the case of the you know automation stuff, it's a it's a important to have the redundancy in the, in the quality assurance with that system. And I, I pointed out, of course, for selected areas, it's important to, to maybe have manual capability, but you got to follow those rules I had at the beginning, making sure you, you know if you're going to implement it, you follow the correct. Correct. Thanks. Yeah, a lot of history there. Um, I have a I have a question. Um, it seems to me that uh, a gross uh, missing item from your presentation is the Apollo One fire. And uh, at the time, I was working for North American Aviation, uh, not on the Apollo program, but it's from that disaster that caused me to be drafted into the Apollo program to do some uh, calculations on the geometry for the whole mission. But uh, I was wondering from your standpoint, Gary, um, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts about the Apollo 1 fire and how that influenced uh, uh, the rest of the space program and how they approached uh, risks of failure from that standpoint? And uh, specifically on that mission, uh, on that uh, disaster, was there anything in your mind that could have been done uh, 
to avoid a disaster like some kind of automatic release of the uh, hatch uh, so the astronaut astronauts could possibly escape uh, if there was some kind of disaster in the capsule? Well, I was in Mission Control Center in Houston on the EPS console in the SSR when the Apollo 1 fire occurred. Back in the very early days, engineers uh, would actually sit alongside their flight control counterparts in the MCC. And in this case, we're monitoring the test. And the failure occurred about 6.30 Cape time, it was 5.30 Houston time. About five o'clock, Kranz and most of the uh, flight control team had been released uh after all jsc was just in a monitor boat for the you know the cape was involved in the test so the flight control counterpart that was sitting with me on the eps control console left i was still there because i was there following the the data and the systems uh, being responsible for power distribution and uh, and so forth uh so myself and mort silver was a uh North American ECS flight controller. He was on the ECS console and I was on the EPS console. We were the only ones in the SSR when the fire occurred. Chris Kraft was still out front and he did have other uh, Moker people out there with him. Uh, and he came, and of course, that, that, it's, it's, it gets to be hard to talk about uh because i was there on on console when this all happened Cran uh chris craft come running back to the ssr and said we're going to be playing back the data we want you to carefully go back through this data to see if you can identify what was close to the, the time of the fire and so i was there all night long looking at data i did note that the time uh the crew uh, hollered fire that uh, we had a short on both main bus A and B at the same time. What that told me is that short that occurred that caused the uh, ignition of the fire had to be a doubted load, which would reduce the number. So later that next day, when I went back to the office, I, uh, I spent my whole time going through trying to identify and write down and, and list all functions or anything that was powered from both main bus A and B. And I had that list. And then about a, and by the way, uh, when, you know, you, when I was on console still there, you knew the crew were in suits. And of course, you know, being pretty naive, I guess, I was thinking, well, the suits and the crew are in their suits, they'll be okay, you know, uh, thinking that. And then of course I heard the test director at the Cape come on and told Chris Kraft to go to a private line. And of course I knew that that was bad news. And Chris had announced on the uh, loops, of course, that the building was being locked up. Everybody was not allowed to leave. And we had, we could make one call uh, to our wives to let them know and not say what it was, but just say we weren't going to be home, which I did. It turns out my wife had already heard on the news, but <laughs> I, I didn't say anything. And then the next week I went down for the investigation. I was sent down there and I was the one engineer charged along with a uh, uh, photographer uh, to go inside the spacecraft and actually in the command module. And of course the, the uh, seats and all the stuff had been taken out but, uh, and had been destacked from the pad. Actually, I was out at the pad uh, just before that. Uh, uh, so I was at pad 34 to to see it, but we didn't go in the capsule at that time. But then I was charged with going through it all and locating. Now it turns out, and I've got some of the folks, you know, Savannah and others have heard my presentations on a 
hollow and fire, and I could even show you uh, location and equipment, uh, lower, lower equipment bay, which I do. Uh, we've determined as the most likely source of the fire. You, for some strange reason, maybe not strange, but they don't they don't show that in the reports. So I've, I've got a photograph of boilerplate 14, which was built just like 12, and was going to be the next spacecraft coming along, spacecraft 14. And I've got a picture of that area. Uh, and I know, and it turns out there was a diode at a load that was powering the environmental control system, ECS. It was over in the left-hand equipment bay. Now that particular area down the lower left-hand equipment bay, that was all gone. When you have an oxygen fire at that high level, you burn aluminum, you burn metal, you burn everything. So you didn't have anything to look at there. So it was part of my investigation of that area. I did go through all the other. Uh, uh, and most of the other areas, by the way, if you wiped off this, this smoke soot, it was you know pristine condition underneath. In other words, there was actually very little da uh, damage elsewhere around the vehicle other than that area around the ECS. Bay area. But I uh, was able to, we were able to look at uh, closeout photographs of that area because they always took closeout photographs late. And uh, there was a wire going over the, uh, this is an area just below Gus Grissom's couch. And uh, it was wrapped and it had a Teflon overwrap over the Teflon wiring that kind of protected and it also went under a, a door that can be opened and closed in these ECS area. The, the last closeout photograph of that area showed that that Teflon overwrap had slipped down and was no longer uh, protecting that twisted power return pair of, of diode and power to there. And uh, at that time this occurred, Gus was trying to change his comm uh, connector, uh, change out the comm connection because they were having communications problems. Well, simulation showed on the ground that if you're suited and you want to try to do that, you got to take your swing your left foot leg off the couch and step down on the floor in that area to twist around and make that connection. So, you know, it's, it's just me saying, and you won't find that in reports, but I think, I think he stepped right on that wire. And of course, he's in a boot, a boot. For sensitivity reasons for the Grissom family and so forth, you don't, you know, that's, that's not mentioned. And you don't, you won't see, uh, but I do do show and talk about, uh, at least talk about that how we determined that as being the ignition source. Well, thanks, Gary. Um, and my question was also about- um... oh, Okay, what, what could we have done? Well, the first thing was uh, materials inside. They actually had foam pads uh, on the bay, uh, down below, uh, below the couches they, they used to protect the flooring and the equipment. And, uh, and there was no, uh, so corrective actions we did for the future. We had metal hard covers all over all external wiring. And you had a, a, a flooring, a hard flooring that could be put in in, in, in a matrix fashion uh, in there for, for, for workmen and so forth. And uh, we should have never been, of course, at 16 PSI when you had uh, materials Materials were only certified at five PSI, but we had a lot of materials in there that weren't even like that foam and a lot of things not certified for that. Uh, Jerry Gridman, who was a crew engineer at the time, was, was actually complaining before the fire that the crew was putting too much Velcro in the spacecraft because Velcro was a concern. There was a limit a limitation in where that was placed and so forth. And the crews liked it because you stick things to it. And they were putting that in a lot of places. 
and, and he was concerned about it that from a flammability standpoint. So you had a you had a case where he didn't have materials com compatibility. He didn't recognize the test at pure oxygen as being hazardous. I also have in my discussions and report about a fire that occurred almost a year before that I got called in to investigate. It was an oxygen fire and that report was classified. So you never got to hear the results of it. And I think, you know, that should have been a wake up call for oxygen fires are hazardous. It was a qualification fire in the environmental control system out at uh, Tor Torrance, California at, uh, at the uh, vendor there that designed the air research, Torrance facility air research that designed the ECS system. That was all hushed up when they had the fire uh, in that chamber. That was at five PSI because that's what the spacecraft was being at. Uh, and I got notified and sent out there to investigate that. And uh, the, so I was in talking, to, uh, and it turns out in reviewing all the data, the, the thing that was done just before the uh, fire and, and the blowing open of the chamber <laughs> that they had this in was uh, the guy turning up the, the uh, variac uh, on the uh, ECS duct heater. And in investigating that, I was talking to, it turns out uh, an instrumentation engineer was in charge of the test. By the way, there was no engineering analysis or materials compatibility analysis of this test either. Uh, the guy in charge of the electrical stuff was an was electrical technician. And when he was trying to come up with uh, how to do the ECS uh, duck heater, he went down to Sears and bought a, uh, one of these heater tapes that you wrap around your hot water line, you know, your cold water lines outside to keep them from freezing. So it was designed to be operated on a cold water line in cold weather, okay, that insulation capability. You took that same wiring and wrapped it around an insulation duct with insulation around that and put it in a vacuum of five PSI pure oxygen. So when you turned on that heater, you were trapping not only heater against that duct, you were heating up that insulation. So you heated the temperature up and there was evidence that the insulation had failed on that uh, heater tape and that caused failure. And by the way, when I wrote up my report on the, uh, in what the cause of the, of the ignition point was and so forth and all about it and, I, and all my data to back up what I was saying, they didn't allow me to say anything about the tech going to buy the here's seat, heater tape, okay? And by the way, that, that didn't show up in any press, anything. It's unfortunate both Rockwell and NASA put the lid on that thing, you know, it's, didn't want to show they had a failure, I guess. Anyway, uh, the other thing is kind of shocking. Here I was involved in the investigation. I was not a part of the uh, Rockwell uh, NASA investigation board, I turned in my report to them. I never saw the final report. I never saw the final report or get a copy of the final report. It's not distributed. And uh, I reconstructed the information uh, for lessons learned in the report in later years, because when he got back, we had to write trip reports. I basically had all of my information I turned into them in my trip report that I had sent you know, to my managers and so forth showing what I'd done. So I used that information to put together. But when I was putting the information together for my uh, report on that investigation, when I was working there for SAS Flight Safety Office, I called up Hank Rotter and some of the guys and I said, 
did they know anything about it? And they said, no, but they, they I tell you what, uh, there's an ECS library over on site and their building. And he would see if they uh, couldn't find, and sure enough. So what was it? Uh, four or five years ago, I finally got to see the actual report, NASA, official NASA investigation report. Uh, so the first time I ever saw what they even put in there about my report, they did identify what I determined it to be, you know, a short in the uh, duck heater. Didn't say much more about it. They also implied that because, uh, that, and they did initiate actions to make sure we had circuit protection devices in case of a short and overload, they could di disconnect and trip. Uh, and, but there was no, uh, like kicking off an investigation of what did materials compatibility have to do with this? Is oxygen a hazardous test? Uh, the, uh, matter of fact, the, the, the bottom line of the report implied, well, since this was really a non-flight hardware that failed, well, they basically indicated they thought they were okay. So, you know, I have concerns that, and my lessons learned out of that is how investigative reports should not be classified and so forth. You need to be open about that sort of stuff. Well, I've given folks a lot more. <laughs> and believe me, a lot of these stories I used to tell is what led to the you know, lessons learned report that uh, some folks have seen. I've got a, it's titled 50 years, you know, Gary Johnson, 50 plus years of human spacecraft. The only regret about a report is they didn't uh, put in anything in there about the shuttle Mir program or the ISS. So I, they limited me to discovering like Apollo, Skylab, ASTP, some of the early space shuttle design. They, were, they wanted to limit the time it took to put the report out and the size of it. And the report didn't have any photographs or, or pictures in it. I've gotten a lot of great feedback from the report though. You know, the George Abbey's, matter of fact, Gerstemeyer sent me a lot of stuff, good information back. And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people have reviewed it and given me good reviews on it, so. Well, uh, well, thank you, Gary. I appreciate that information. Uh, I can tell you from uh, working at North American Aviation at that time that uh, it was, of course, a, a devastating blow for the company uh, on that incident. Uh, but after a, a year or two and maybe a little more years, uh, they looked at it as a silver lining for the whole space program in that uh, it made us concentrate on uh, errors uh, and safety a lot more than than it used to than it used to be, and uh, uh, the feeling, uh, of course, from their point of view, is that it probably saved uh, some disasters in the future uh, because there were it was a lot more concentration on right. what could go wrong that right. wasn't uh, considered before. Right, and that, and that's what also led us to having these design uh, ma manager walkthrough inspections of every spacecraft before we shipped it to the Cape. And I was the one that went through all of those spacecraft to check and verify the wiring was okay. And we did that on the uh, orbiter, or, orbiters for space shuttle. Uh, because right after Apollo fire, we had a, a center design requirements that any spacecraft managed by JSC you needed to have these walkthrough inspections before. And we had these ADA design stamps. Unfortunately, that wasn't applied to space station. And the reason was that was managed out of headquarters. And even though I raised a big issue about that and so forth and about what that helped us on the other programs, they, they turned all that down. And uh, probably would have pre prevented having one of our ISS radiators up there that's not quite as efficient as the other one because it was connected up wrong. Because uh, one thing that the inspections did was, that was by the way, the first time 
our NASA de Rockwell engineers got to look at the spacecraft too. There was a union, I was shocked to find out in those early days that there's a union requirement that I could go down there as a NASA person on the manufacturing floor and look at some of the hardware and stuff and look at that. The design engineers were not allowed down on the manufacturing floor. So when we had these walkthrough inspections, we'd have the Rockwell designer as well. And this one case of having the walk around inspection on Columbia before we shipped to the Cape probably saved Columbia for any future flight because uh, it wasn't me that found it, but the Rockwell thermal guy was going through and doing, as the, we had all these teams doing the inspection. He was looking at the installation of the water lines going from the forward compartment to the aft compartment. And he noticed they were mounted directly to structure and they were supposed to be on insulated standoffs because there, there was a heater mounted on the lines but obviously not, not very good if you're trying to heat up the whole orbiter instead of the line. So he was able to flag and they caught that and corrected it. Now you say, why can't, how, how come quality assurance didn't catch that? And a lot of people may not realize quality insurance inspects to the manufacturer's installation drawings, okay, to make sure it's installed correctly to the manufacturer's installation drawing. They don't inspect for the design. So if, you know, all, that, all the quality, quality assurance folks did was ensure that that was mounted the structure, okay? So there's evidence there of how that, this letting the designers look at the actual hardware saved us for that particular case. But, Gary, that's and yes. what we are using right now approach is verification and validation. So what quality assurance is essentially did or have done is the verification. It's uh, if uh, if it's uh, dis or if it's uh, implemented according to requirements, and validation is if it's uh, designed and will and perform to the the way that it's uh, expected. Oh, um, and that that's where you would uh, be checking uh, for additional whether it's uh, it's implementation to what's needed or it's something that is uh, absolutely not going to be used or if there is a uh, hazards that have been introduced with the implementation. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm way, way over. Sorry about that. That's well, all right. We always always happy to have you and uh, we really don't have a limit i though i i like to be uh, to stay conscious for the other people's uh, time con uh, constraints i want to drill quickly uh, plug in for our next saturday we will have a uh, kumar krishan uh, coming with uh, his with presentation on inspiration imagination inclusion and leadership for a great future and so that will be for uh, our diversity uh, uh, effort within our section. And uh, everyone is obviously welcome to join us. I will send uh, the description of this uh, presentation uh, via our uh, voice of communication, both through AAA Houston uh, mail li uh, mailing list, ma mailing distribution, as well as uh, engage, AAA engage. So how, Whichever way you have received the announcement about this uh, presentation, you most likely will get the next one. Otherwise, uh, Gary, you are welcome to answer as many questions uh, as uh, oh, our attendees have. And uh, uh, for our attendees, for those that are not uh, uh, frequent uh, uh, attendees, uh, Gary uh, attends, uh, relatively speaking, frequently. And uh, in our informal uh, interaction, he answers and provides uh, many stories, just like what you heard right now. Gary, your floor again. Uh, yeah, um, somebody did have a question about the Saturn V manual control option because uh, he came in late. But yes, we did have, but it was for second stage and third stage of the Saturn V, not, not first stage. Don Edberg, I think, asked that question. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Thanks very much for all the thank yous I got.
Yeah, I was the uh, following the EDA, being responsible for the emergency detection system. I did have some interfaces with the Marshall Saturn V folks, and I had a chance to be on the, at the spacecraft level at the pad prior to Apollo 8's launch on the Saturn V. Never got, never got to see an Apollo, uh, Apollo launch, so other than the uh, board testing we did out of the White Sands. I was always at the uh, mission evaluation room back in Houston. <coughs> well, thank you everyone for sure. thank you. joining us. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I, I always feel uh, uh, special because you have joined us and uh, you have so much to share and so many stories uh, to share and, uh, and knowledge to transfer. I wish we can just uh, <laughs> plug in some sort of uh, external you're, you're drive and uh, upload it. <laughs> You'll get bored quick. <laughs> right. Anyway. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Have a great uh, week and we'll see okay, you next Saturday. You. Thank you Thank for you. joining.